Hi, my name is Marcy Trent Long. Welcome to Sustainable Asia. This is the Plasticity Podcast, made in collaboration with Ocean Recovery Alliance. We began this series by learning how the circular economy in Asia is gaining momentum through recent commitments made by governments and global brands. Next, we saw how we can improve the collection and sorting stage through better monitoring and infrastructure. In episode three, we talked about removing contamination from the waste streams to make recycling easier and more profitable. But lastly, in this episode, In order to make recycled goods a part of our daily lives, we need to do away with some misconceptions first. With consumers, there tends to be, even to this day, a a common misconception that, that recycled material or recycled content is somehow an inferior quality. That's Brian Thurston, Senior Advisor to the Plastic Disclosure Project, co organizers of the Plasticity Forum. So I think that. The brands have a more important role to play on the education around what those materials are. In order for the circular economy to scale, it, it, you know, the recycled material isn't, isn't labeled recycled material. It's just material. And it's not of less quality. It's not of higher price. It's not all these things that are sort of relegating it to being exclusive. Um, that's never really going to get to the heart of the problem of, of getting volumes of those material back into the supply chain. I met a lot of people who are working on changing the way we see and how we use recycled material. Jose Lopez is one of them. I'm Jose Lopez. I work at MiniWiz. I'm from Ecuador originally. At MiniWiz, Jose is working on a material library, a collection made from recycled elements demonstrating what's possible with a little creativity. Creativity and design is very important because people think that uh, by using recycled material, you're uh, cutting the design wings, cutting the creativity. Of course, it's a challenge because it requires a lot of effort. It requires a lot of engineering. Something you don't want to break the creativity, let's say the design concept of a building, of an interior, requires and in, in, in the projection you have in your mind. The objects we use in our daily lives are made of materials that have specific necessary properties. The elasticity of nylon and clothes, the lightness of styrofoam. If we want to recreate those properties with plastic recycled content. You need to do a lot of research to see how the key elements can actually be sorted out and have the property that you need to get that effect. So that, that's, that is why we have our material library. That's why we created 1,200 materials, because every single material will obey to a specific case, a specific finish that we want. Kian Ho Se of Hung Hyep Industries, who spoke in our last episode, also experiments with the recyclable material he collects in Malaysia. So I look into washing machine, I look into the washing machine drums, and then I study the property, the uniqueness of that inherent property. So we collect that back and together with other compounds that have similar, you know, we basically convert all the specification into a spiderweb chart. And then we try to pair with more property, a more material or base material, which has similar spider web chart. And from there, we basically stretch that. We start to see that spikiness, you know, on the spider web chart. And then through our own formulation, we push that further. By combining recovered materials with similar properties, he can create new materials with custom characteristics. In that upcycling, process, we actually make something that is double, if not triple, in terms of its strength compared to new material. And then from there, we create a material which is perfect for pin bucket. So it goes from one and then it transforms to the other, all simply by aligning the inherent property and to actually transcend that so that it can actually, you can actually give that a second life or if not a much better second life and upcycle the product. 
So when you return your ink cartridge to HP, and we hope everybody does, uh, we disassemble that cartridge and take all of the individual materials and either sell them back on the materials market. For example, the metals in the cartridge get sold back. Ellen Chikowski, Global Head of Sustainability, Strategy, and Innovation at Hewlett Packard. Until we're left with just the plastic case of that ink cartridge, we shred that case and then we mix it with water bottle plastic, PET plastic, um, or hanger plastic to strengthen it back up again so it has the properties of virgin plastic, create another ink cartridge out of that recycled content, put ink back in it, and put it on the market. And the idea is that the plastic um, that we create for our products gets reused over and over again. In this process, we're upcycling bottle plastic, right, which doesn't typically have tremendous value to it, and we're putting it in HP ink cartridges, one of our high volume products, one of our most valuable products. Innovation in the recycling industry shows that recycled materials are not necessarily of a lower quality. Instead, when there's a sufficient supply of post-consumer waste, recycling facilities can produce quality products in larger quantities. Once those barriers are going down, then I think you're going to see a, a much larger adoption of this material in products. Brian Thurston. And it's not going to be because of some environmental issue. It's not going to be because of some regulatory um, requirement. It'll just because it's good business. And ultimately, I think that that's what gets you to scale. Doug Woodring, who organizes the Plasticity Conference, agreed. And I think people are now realizing that, wow, there's so much stuff you can do with plastic. Of course, we don't want to use uh, unnecessary plastic and just create the need for transportation and waste collection. But we are going to be using plastic in our next few decades. And the challenge and opportunities is how to design for this and make all kinds of new things from it. And this is what the world is only just starting to embrace. Better collection and sorting of plastics in Asia means that more plastic will be available to recycle. Removing contaminants before they enter the recycling facilities will also make it cheaper and faster to process. And when brands and consumers globally recognize that we can make pretty much anything we want out of recycled plastic, then the demand for post-consumer recycled plastic will grow. Eventually, we'll achieve the economies of scale needed to make plastic recycling in Asia successful. The circle will be complete, and we will have broken the straight line that leads to so much plastic leaking into our oceans. Thank you for listening to the Plasticity Podcast. I want to thank all the people who took the time to talk to me about this fascinating process. For those of you who want to be a part of the growing plasticity movement, the next plasticity conference will be in Fiji. So the reason we're doing Plasticity Pacific in Fiji in March is because the island nations uh, are looking for ways to solve their plastic waste problem. And they have problems with economies of scale and equipment and technology that is sized appropriately for their communities, which are not so big. We expect the island nations to be a case study example for many small communities around the world, because if they, whether they're an island nation or not, many small communities also have the same challenge of economies of scale and not getting the right equipment to get up the value chain in recycling. Special thanks to our sponsors, the Swire Group Charitable Trust creating positive change in education, marine and arts, through supporting registered nonprofit organizations, primarily in Hong Kong and China. If you like what you hear, subscribe to the Sustainable Asia podcast, and please give us a rating. You can also find Sustainable Asia on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Show notes are posted on our website, sustainableasia.co. The Plasticity Podcast is produced by Sustainable Asia in collaboration with Ocean Recovery Alliance. The series was created by me, Marcy Trent Long, written, edited, and mixed by Sam Beckemans. The music in this episode is made from repurposed and recovered waste items by Alexander Mobison. Learn more about his music at kalelover.net. 
Voiceovers were recorded at Aya Recording Studios.